Last week we started a new Bible study, and it has the title, These Are Written, The Writing of the Bible According to the Bible. And so, the next month or two, we're going to talk about what the Bible says about how it was written. And I think this is important because I hear a lot of you ask questions about how the Bible came to be. How do we know that this is really God's Word? How do we know that we got the right books? Who wrote it and when did they write it and how did this all come together? And those are the type of questions that we'll cover as we go through this Bible study. Last time, just to start, I had my Bible Basics chart. I told you that when people become members of our church, when they take our Faith Builders classes, one of the things that we go through is just basic information on the Bible. So I know some of you were here last time, some of you weren't. I'm going to give you two or three minutes either on your own or with the people around you, see how many of these boxes on this chart you can fill in. So we got Old Testament, New Testament. Who were the writers? What language? How many books? When was it written? What's the content? And all of you can fill in at least a few things on this chart. All right, take two or three minutes and see how much you can fill in. Ready, go. <laughs> All right, let's come back together as a group. I bet you could fill in at least some of the information on here. All right, so let's go through it again. The more times we go through it, the more it will stick in our minds. First of all, what's the difference between the Old and New Testament? Absolutely simple. The Old Testament is written before Jesus. The New Testament is written after Jesus. That's the difference. Okay, the divider right in the middle is Jesus was born. Right? Which one is longer? Old Testament or New Testament? Oh. Old Testament is significantly longer. It's like 80%. And the New Testament is 20%. So it's not two halves. It's two parts divided by when Jesus himself actually came. All right. Here's the chart. The writers of the Old Testament in general, who wrote the Old Testament? Prophets did. Excellent. Prophets did. And often, in addition to just prophets in general, we'll, we'll use two names. Mostly because the New Testament mentions them specifically. Moses and David. Good. The prophets wrote the Old Testament, along with Moses and David. Moses was a prophet, of course. David was a king. All right, New Testament. Who are the writers? The apostles. The apostles. So the twelve disciples of Jesus plus Paul. That's who we usually refer to with the apostles. And then we said there's a little, not an asterisk, but a little kind of added thing. The apostles and... Good and... A few people connected to the apostles. 
Luke and Jude and James and you don't have to write all their names, but just the, the apostles and then a few people connected to them. Okay, Mark, Mark and Luke and Jude and James. Okay, so Old Testament prophets, the New Testament, the disciples or the apostles. What language was the Old Testament written in? Hebrew. 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 Why? That's what the Israelites spoke. Makes sense. Those prophets, they, they knew Hebrew. The people knew Hebrew, so they wrote Hebrew. New Testament was written in? Greek. Greek. Because? Not because that's what the apostles actually spoke on a daily basis, but because Greek was like the world language. And so the New Testament was written even from the beginning with this focus on this is going to be for everybody to read. And since Alexander the Great conquered the world 300 years before Jesus, Greek was the language that was spoken all over the world. So the New Testament was written in Greek. Alright, how many books are in the Old Testament? 39. 39 and in the New Testament? 47. And all together that's you guys, are, you guys are really sharp today. I usually don't have very high expectations for you. This is really, this is really good. Alright? Now, we said last time, when you look at a Bible, what we call the books of the Bible, we would refer to like chapters today, right? It's like it's one book with all these chapters. Why is that not the right way to think about it? So that's true. What we have as chapters weren't in the original. I'm thinking of, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to think of something different. Excellent. The books, we call them books because what were they actually when they were written? They were separate books, separate scrolls. Okay, and they were written by different people. And so for us today, we, well, it's one book. And that's true, it's one book, but it really is 66 different books. All with a united message, all inspired by God that we put together into our Bibles. And we just mentioned kind of as a side point that it's true over time different people have sometimes put the books in different orders in the Bible. And why did we say that's not surprising and it doesn't really matter? Because if all the books were scrolls, how would they have been kept originally anyways? They would just been kept all in like a basket or a pot, all together. Okay, you don't think of an order. They were there. This is God's word. Okay, and so don't be surprised if in ancient writing sometimes the books were in a different order, right? Together, these make up God's word. The time. During what time period was the Old Testament written? Excellent. Do you even remember the dates? This is a good day. 1400 BC to 400 BC. Now those are of course just rough dates, but about a thousand year period, the Old Testament's written. Okay, which really makes it an amazing book to imagine that 40 different people wrote part of the Bible over over a thousand years and in all the Greece. And you think if we had 40 people today trying to write a book together, they wouldn't agree with each other, right? And this is, this is evidence of God guiding this whole process. Right? The New Testament, what time period was that written in? Good. Just one generation from 50 to 100 AD. Again, those are rough dates. But over the course of about 50 years, just during the lifespan of Jesus' disciples, the whole New Testament is written. So the Old Testament over a long span is a break of over 400 years and the New Testament over a small span just because this was during the life of Jesus' disciples. And finally, the content. Of course, there's all sorts of content in the Bible, but we mentioned a couple main things. Hey, Michael? To give you an idea of how old is our nation, uh -huh. less than 400. Good, good point. So you think of how old the Bible is and you know, our country is 250 years old, isn't it? If I do math fast, 
We must be having an anniversary coming up here, yeah. huh? 2026 would be 250 years. And it seems like a long time, right? Yep. And then you think about the Bible and wow, it's a long time ago, right? God's word endures. That's what God promises. Good point. All right, thinking about the content, the Old Testament, what are the main things that the Old Testament talks about? Jesus. Jesus. It talks about Jesus, but what does it say about Jesus? He's coming. Jesus will come. If you think of the Old Testament, that's, that's the biggest thing you should remember. The Old Testament says Jesus will come, and then it gives us the history, especially of whom? The Israelites. The Israelites. The history of the Israelites. It actually gives us the history all the way back to the creation of the world. But most of the Old Testament is focused on the Savior will come, and here's the story of the Israelites. Okay, now what's similar two things can we say for the New Testament? Who is the New Testament all about? Jesus. Jesus, but what does it say about Jesus? He came. He came. Jesus came. And he was born in Bethlehem and rose from the dead. But then the New Testament also has the story of a group of people. The story of the Christian church. Good. So the New Testament, this is Jesus came, and then the story of the early Christian church. And so both parts of the Bible really have the same message. It's about Jesus. Either he's coming or he came. And then it's, and here's the story of God's people. What God did for the Israelites, what God did for those early Christians. That was really good. I think you can remember that chart. Just basic information on the Bible. Here's a couple more review questions. Okay, this is what we talked about last time. In the whole book of Genesis, you will not find this word. Right. 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 And so in all the things that we hear in Genesis, God never tells anybody, write this down. Not at all. You maybe wouldn't think about that, but God speaks to Adam, and then to Noah, and then to Abraham. And he never says, write this down. Did people in those days still have God's word? Yes, yes of course they did. Right? They had God's word. It was just a spoken word that they remembered and shared with each other. But it was still God's word. When were God's words first written down? With Moses. With Moses. Does anybody remember we, we read the story last week? This is kind of the extra credit question. But we read the story last week of when God first tells Moses, you got to write this down. What had just happened when God first says to Moses, write this down? The Ten Commandments was the second time. Something happened before that. There was a battle. I just praise you for how long you remember <laughs> what I get. <laughs> there was a battle. Do you remember the battle in the days of Moses? What, what happened that was noteworthy in this battle? And then God says, write this down. Dave, rescue us. Yes. So the, the Israelites in the wilderness, leaving Egypt, have to fight the Amalekites. And Joshua leads them into battle, but Moses needed to stand there. Well, he didn't have to stand there. He had to have his hands up. He had his hands up. And could Moses keep his hands up all on his own? No. no. And so two other men come and they hold up Moses' hands. Who were the other men? Aaron. Aaron and Hur. And they hold up Moses' hands. And as long as Moses kept his hands up, Joshua and the army, they defeated the Amalekites. And they got done. And God said, write this down. Write this down. And then somebody mentioned... Next, we hear about the Ten Commandments, and God says to Moses, write this down to it. Finally, what two reasons does the book of Exodus give for having God's Word written down? First of all, to remember it, to remember and share it. So after this battle with the Amalekites, God says to Moses, write this down, and he specifically says, so Joshua can remember this. Right? He's going to have to fight a whole bunch more battles. 
And I want Joshua to remember how I'm the one who gave them victory. And then connected with the Ten Commandments, there was another reason that God had his word written down, and it was maybe unexpected or surprising. When God appeared to the Israelites at Mount Sinai, how did they feel? Terrified. And what did they actually say to God? They said, don't talk to us face to face. Right? Because what happens when our perfect God talks to sinful people face to face? They get terrified. Okay, you know, every time in the Bible that an angel appears to somebody, do you know what the angel always has to tell them first? Don't be afraid. Every time. So God had his word written down so that we could hear God's voice without being terrified. So that we could hear God speak to us without seeing him face to face. So these are the two first reasons we hear for writing down the Bible. Right? Remember what's happened. And so that we can hear God's voice without him terrifying us. We get to read the Bible. Right? There was also the glory. Explain that a little more. He said there's also the glory. When he was in the presence of the Lord, his face shone. Yeah. Excellent. Yep. So there's, there's more reasons, too, why God had his word written down. But the first two things we hear about are this, to remember it, and to not have to speak to God face to face. But yeah, when Moses left God's presence on Mount Sinai, his face shone. And he actually had to cover his face, because the people were even afraid to look at Moses. And then Moses covered his face so that they wouldn't see the glory fading away. And just this whole idea of God is awesome. And so the thought that he had his word written down for us, this is an act of God's love. He wants to speak to us. He wants us to hear. Right, turn to the next page. And let's go on. Today we're going to think about what exactly Moses wrote. And what the Bible says that Moses wrote is the book of the law. Start with, I've got four passages here that each talk about God's word being written down. And I, I'm just going to read them, and then let's just think about something we might learn from each passage. So first, Exodus 24, verses 3 and 4. When Moses went and told the people all the Lord's words and laws, they responded with one voice, everything the Lord has said we will do. Then Moses wrote down everything the Lord had said. What do those two verses tell us about writing down God's word? Yeah, it has this word, everything. Okay, and so as Moses is writing down, he, he's conscious. I, I want to write down everything. What else does this tell us about what Moses is writing down? What is he actually writing down? What the Lord had said. Okay, now, obviously, this is, a, this is a simple thing. It's a simple verse. Okay, but Moses, is, is he's writing down the first books of the Bible. Okay, is he just writing down his own personal thoughts about stuff? You know, is he writing down legends that he's had passed on to him from the past? No, he's writing down what the Lord said. And I want to write down everything that the Lord has said. Okay, here's the next verse. Exodus 34, 27 to 28. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write down these words, for in accordance with these words I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. Moses was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights without eating bread or drinking water, and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. We hear about writing down God's word. From those two verses. It was a covenant with God. There's this covenant. Right? So we hear about the old covenant. Sometimes it's called the Mosaic covenant. This was God's agreement with his people. The Israelites were God's special people. God was going to be their God. And this was something that was going to be written down. Good. Something else. 
Yeah, so it's obviously this miraculous setting. Moses' time on Mount Sinai was a miracle. It was in the presence of God, and to go without eating or drinking, this isn't something that can normally happen to human beings. Okay? Good. What else do we learn about what he writes down? The Ten Commandments. He writes down the Ten Commandments. Okay, this is actually interesting. When you read Exodus 20, where the Ten Commandments are given, it doesn't actually call them the Ten Commandments. It doesn't even number them for us. I was talking about this with some people this last week. That the Ten Commandments, it just lists, just has commands. And this is why different Christians sometimes number the commandments differently. But this would be a place where the Bible clearly tells us there's Ten Commandments. And Moses wrote those down. And what did he write them on? Tablets. So... At least for these tablets, these Ten Commandments, he's not writing them on a scroll. He's actually writing them on something, oops, did I just switch? Something solid. He's writing them on tablets. Okay, maybe the final thing, it's kind of obvious, but I want you to pick this up. Who actually tells him to write it down? The Lord. The Lord does, right? We said this word doesn't show up in Genesis. Genesis never says to anybody, write this down. But now when we get to Moses, God tells Moses, you need to write this down. Okay? So he writes on the tablets, Ten Commandments. Right? Here's another passage. In the book of Numbers. Here are the stages in the journey of the Israelites when they came out of Egypt by divisions under the leadership of Moses and Aaron. At the Lord's command, Moses recorded the stages in their journey. This is their journey by stages. And then the book of Numbers lays it out. What does this tell us about Moses writing down God's word? God told him to do it. God told him to do it. Right? The Lord's command, Moses recorded. What is he recording here? He's just recording history. And so in these previous passages in Exodus, he's writing down God's law, God's covenant. There's lots of laws in the Old Testament. But here, God tells Moses, I don't just want you to write down the commands. I want you to record for everybody the different places that you went as you went from Egypt to the Promised Land. And so Moses records that. And so in the Bible, are the commands of God, are they really God's word? Yes. Are the history sections that just tell history, is that really God's word? Yes. God wants us to know that too. All right, one more verse. Deuteronomy 12, 32. See that you do all I command you to do. Do not add to it or take away from it. So what, Moses, what God is having Moses write down, how important was it? Very important. All right. Was it something that you know when you when you want to change a little bit, you go right ahead and you think of something to add, throw it in there. You know, this is a work in progress. It's kind of was that the attitude? No, not at all. Right? A couple of verses down, they get consequences. Absolutely. So the book of Deuteronomy gives some serious consequences if if you add or subtract from God's word. And, Maybe this reminds you of a different place in the Bible. Where else in the Bible says this exact thing? Revelation 22, the, the book of Revelation, the whole Bible ends with, with John writing down. Anybody who adds to this, God's going to add to you plagues. And anyone who subtracts from this, God's going to subtract your, your place in the kingdom of God. Okay, and so it seems like this was maybe a new idea to have Moses writing down God's word, the, the laws of God, the history of God's people. But the moment he wrote it down, what were the people to, to look at it as? God's word. This is God's word. The moment it gets written down, this is something we're going to follow. We're not going to change. We're not going to add or subtract. Any questions that far? Michael? Can you dive into a translations with this statement? in mind. Dive into translations with this statement in mind? 
How so? Like which translations are good or bad or how translation works? Uh, so see to it that you do all I command you. Do not add to it or take away from it. Uh, I don't know if I'm thinking what you're thinking, but... Well, you got your King James versus yeah. your NIV versus your... And there's many, many yeah, translations. There's all sorts of different translations. So we actually had a Bible study of translations not too long ago. And uh, so we've been talking about that. But one thing you could say with this is God's commands are something that can easily be translated in other languages. God's Word can too. And so the important thing is that God's Word and commands are translated faithfully. If they are, we know that that's God's Word too. And so God's Word when translated is still God's Word. Of course, it needs to be done faithfully in line with what the Greek or the Hebrew say. And one cool thing, I don't know if I've shared this before, but thinking about translations, so what language did we say the New Testament was written in? Greek. Greek. And we said that that's not what Jesus and his disciples probably spoke. Do you know what they probably spoke? Aramaic. Aramaic. And so, the New Testament itself, what is it? It's a translation. <coughs> which is kind of cool to think about. That when we have Jesus' words in the New Testament, even in the original language in Greek, that's a translation of what Jesus actually said. And the fact that God did that, it shows us, is a translation just as good as the real thing? Yes. Absolutely. Every once in a while in the New Testament, the writers will throw in what the actual word is. So Jesus opened, opens up a, someone's mouth and he says, Ephatha. And then the, the translate, but that means be opened. Or on the cross, Jesus says, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. And so every once in a while, the author actually, put, these are the original words, right? But clearly, what God says is, what's important is the content of the message. And what's amazing about God's work, God's work can be translated into different languages at different times. As long as it's a faithful translation, this is God's word. And we shouldn't add from, to it or subtract from it. Let's get back to the uh, fasting. Mm -hmm. I don't recall because I was focused on the uh, time, mm -hmm. not not the uh, kind. Was it specific as to what kind of fasting Jesus did? Was it food and drink as well? So Jesus or did fasting he just and, say uh, that he fasted forty days? That's a good question. So if you're thinking of Jesus fasting 40 days in the wilderness before, as the devil was tempting him, I don't remember off the top of my head if it says so he fasted from food and drink or if it was just but, from food. But the, when, when uh, uh -huh. it said Moses didn't drink as well, yeah. because when we, when I in the past talked about fasting, uh -huh. drink comes up. Yeah. So this is where this Moses not eating or drinking for 40 days and 40 nights, that certainly makes us think about Jesus being tempted by the devil in the wilderness. But I think we're both admitting we don't remember whether with Jesus it says food and drink or not. But it certainly is a parallel. They both had this period of fasting. Right? Great questions. Good discussion. Right? What I want to go to next is showing you how Jesus talked about what Moses wrote. And this is what's so helpful is when we think about the Old Testament to know that Jesus and his disciples, they had the same Old Testament. And so they can kind of confirm for us that the Bible that we have is exactly what they had too. And so Mark 12, Jesus says, Now about the dead rising, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the account of the burning bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. So Jesus is talking to people who don't believe that people rise from the dead. And what does he point them to? The burning bush. The burning bush. And what does Jesus call the place in the Bible that it comes from? The book of Moses. And so Jesus considered what Moses wrote down to be the Word of God. Alright, and so in the book of Moses, don't you remember how this, this happened? And, okay, do you know which actual book, according to how we call them, the story of the burning bush is found in? 
not Genesis. Exodus. It's not an Exodus. And so Jesus certainly can say, this is true. You should know this. Right? Why are you not believing in people rising from the dead? You should, you should know this. From the book of Exodus. It's in the book of Moses. Right? In Luke chapter 5, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him. Then Jesus ordered him, Don't tell anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. And so Jesus heals a man with leprosy, and then he tells him, Well, now you, of course you have to go and show yourself to the priest. Why? Good, as a testimony to them, that's true. But because who told you to? Moses commanded you to do that. Alright? Do you know what book of the Bible especially has all the, the special commands Moses had written down, like about cleansing and health and stuff? They? Leviticus. Leviticus. Some in Deuteronomy 2 and Exodus, but Leviticus is the book that has all these, these rules for the Israelites about if this happens, then you do this, and this happens. And there were rules that someone's going to be cleansed from a skin disease. They need to go and show themselves to the priests. And so what did Jesus think about the book of Leviticus? This is true. Right? This is God's word. People of Jesus, that you should, you should do what this says. Right? One more. John 5. But do not think I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses on whom your hopes are set. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? And so Jesus is talking with the Pharisees and teachers of the law, those who opposed him. And it's a pretty, pretty powerful argument that he makes. He says, well, you don't, you don't even have to believe me, but you should at least believe whom? Moses. Right? But he adds this, who did Moses actually write about? Jesus. Moses wrote about me. Okay, and so Jesus, in the New Testament, he talks pretty often about those first books of the Bible that Moses wrote. Sometimes he called it the book of Moses. Sometimes he just talks about Moses. And Jesus considered this God's word, and already Moses was writing down, telling God's people about Jesus. Right, now, do you remember how many years before Jesus, Moses lived? 1,500. Good. I always wish more people would know this. <laughs> because I try to teach you this timeline, right? All right, let's do the timeline. Right, you, need, you need it. Somebody told me I should put it up on the wall. Maybe I need to do that. Just, can I paint it on the wall here in big letters? Right? So, somebody lived about 2000 BC. Abraham. Abraham did. Okay, now we're just using rough dates because I'm nice and I want you to remember them. Somebody lived about 1500 BC. Moses. Moses did. Okay, somebody really important lived about 1000 BC. David. David did. And then a big event happened about 500 BC. Again, rough dates. The destruction of Jerusalem, all right? And then something happened in about the year zero. Jesus. Jesus was born, all right? And this is just helpful for me to kind of, that's chronology of the Old Testament. And so Moses is 1500 BC. And so for 1,500 years, the people of Israel and anyone who believed in the true God had access to Moses' writings. And Jesus says, these are still true. These are talking about me. You know, you Jews of the year zero, you should be really paying attention to what this guy wrote down 1,500 years ago. This would really help you understand what you're seeing in life today. The book of Moses is God's word. Hmm. Jesus also referred to the parts that we didn't need to follow anymore. Yes. The kosher. Yes. Excellent. But he referred to the law as he was filling it. Absolutely. And so remember, 
when Jesus was on earth, he was the bridge between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And so Jesus kept all of the laws of Moses. And so he kept the Sabbath day. Right? He didn't keep it sometimes the way the Pharisees thought he should, but he kept the Sabbath day. Right? He observed all the festivals. He goes to Jerusalem for all these different things. He had the Passover meal. And so Jesus perfectly fulfilled God's law. And then he died on the cross for us. And when he died on the cross, what was one of the last things he said? It's finished. It's finished. He had completed, he had completed all of God's word for us. And so this is where the New Testament tells us that today for Christians, it says, don't let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink. Or with regard to a Sabbath day or a religious festival, these are a shadow. The reality is found in Christ. And so this is why the New Testament tells Christians today, we're not bound by all those commands of the Mosaic Law. They were good commands for God's people, but they were shadows pointing to Jesus and now that we have Jesus, there aren't dietary rules for Christians. Okay, the Sabbath day is not something that governs Christians anymore. We can worship God any day that we want to. Right? But what our focus is on, the reality is found in Christ. Great point. Now I want you to actually open up your Bible. And, uh, if you have it open already, that's good. Today we're going to Spend time in the book of Deuteronomy. So open up to Deuteronomy. And in the time that's left, we're going to read a couple of different parts of Deuteronomy. Thinking about this idea of God writing down God's word for us. As you're turning there, I guess I skipped one little part. So at the bottom of the last section, I have, I have this question on your sheet. Which of these statements is true? The book of the law became part of the Bible when people accepted it as God's word? Or the book of the, Bible, the law became part of the Bible the moment God spoke its words to Moses? B. B. Right, this was God's word. Sometimes people believed it, followed it, sometimes they didn't. But this was God's word, the moment that God had Moses write it down. Right, let's read some places where this is mentioned. So Deuteronomy chapter 10. Right, today we're going to just be in the book of Deuteronomy. So once you get there, it'll be easier to find what we're going to read. Deuteronomy chapter 10. I'm going to read verses 1 to 5. I hear the pages settling down. Deuteronomy chapter 10. At that time, the Lord said to me, Chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones, and come up to me on the mountain. Also make a wooden ark. I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Then you are to put them into the ark. So I made the ark out of acacia wood and chiseled out two stone tablets like the first ones. And I went up on the mountain with the two tablets in my hands. The Lord wrote on these tablets what he had written before, the Ten Commandments, he proclaimed to you on the mountain, out of the fire, on the day of the assembly. And the Lord gave them to me. Then I came back down the mountain and put the tablets in the ark I had made, as the Lord commanded me, and they are there now. We're thinking about God's word being written. This is just really interesting to hear, hear how this happens. And so, according to these verses, the Ten Commandments were written on stone tablets by whom? By God himself. How does this, I don't know how this works. Right? This is what the Bible says, though. God himself wrote those commandments on the tablets. And as we're reading this, it, it says you need to make tablets like the first ones. So this is the second set of stone tablets. Do you remember what happened to the first ones? They broke. Okay? Moses threw them down because when he came down, he saw the Israelites worshiping in golden calf. And he was so angry and frustrated that he threw them down and they broke. And so God now is writing the Ten Commandments a second time on the second set of stone tablets. 
thinking about this, it made me write this question. I agree or disagree? Once it's written down, you can't get rid of the Word of God. Sure, and I just think this is a cool thought. And God gives us lots of promises that His Word is going to endure. And you just see little hints of this, right? Ten Commandments are written down, Moses comes down the mountain and breaks them, and we're kind of like, oh man, I wish we had those. Right? I wish we knew what that was. And, but that's not how it works with God's Word. And God makes sure that His Word endures. Okay, once it's written down, it, it's hard to get rid of God's Word. And as you go through history, there's been different times when God's Word has almost, it seems, almost been extinguished. But it's never worked. Okay, in a couple of weeks, we'll read about King Josiah. King Josiah is the one who finds the Bible hidden away in the temple. It almost seems like it had almost been lost. But then Josiah finds it. We're going to read about Jeremiah. Jeremiah would write down God's word and the king would throw it in the fire. He'd actually take it and throw it in the fire. And then God would say, write down it again. And here's some more. Add on to it. Even more than what it was before. Okay, and even in you thinking about the history of the Christian church, there were some Roman emperors who were against Christianity. And over time they realized that if you want to get rid of Christians... The best thing isn't to kill the Christians, because that just makes more people be Christians. If you want to get rid of Christians, you have to get rid of the Bible. And so in the Roman Emperor, there are actually periods where Roman leaders would, they, would, they wouldn't round up and kill the Christians. They would round up all the copies of the Bible they could and destroy it. And you think, wow, there's been times when it would seem from our perspective like it's pretty close that people are going to lose God's word. But did it ever happen? No. Okay, right from the start. Right, human beings can do what they want to to try to destroy God's word. Of course, Moses wasn't trying to destroy the word, but it happened. And God's going to make sure that his word endures. And there's one more question here. Where were the Ten Commandments stored? In the Ark of the Covenant. And so here, we don't have a big description of it here. Obviously, other places in the Bible, there's bigger descriptions. It says you're supposed to make this ark. And it's talking about the Ark of the Covenant, which was just this rectangular box that was very special features to it. But that's where they were going to be placed. So if anybody wants to actually know the real Ten Commandments, they're, they're in that Ark of the Covenant, Moses said. I'm not fully in step with this. Once God speaks it, mm -hmm. you can't get rid of it. Mm -hmm. I'm a big believer in the leading of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. If God tells you to or not to do something, mm -hmm. that's not wrote down. But you're still not going to get rid of it. True. But what God wants us to focus on is what he's actually written down in the Bible. So if you or I today say, well, the Bible says this, but I hear this voice telling me something different. What we're doing then is we're contradicting we're contradicting God's well, word. You're falling back to the written word that we know. Right. So then which you is God's go, spoken word. You actually go back to God's word. That's kind of what the point is. We always want to go back to God's God's written word. That's what we know is true and what we trust. All right. I said we're going to read a couple different sections. So there's one. God wrote down the Ten Commandments. They put them in the Ark of the Covenant. Okay. Turn ahead to Deuteronomy 31. Like I said, we get to stay in the same book, but we're going to read different places. Deuteronomy 31. And we'll hear more about writing down God's Word. Deuteronomy 31, 24 to 29. Sounds like we're there. So Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 24. It says, After Moses finished writing in a book the words of this law from beginning to end, he gave this command to the Levites who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Take this book of the law and place it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God. There it will remain as a witness against you. For I know how rebellious and stiff-necked you are. If you have been rebellious against the Lord while I am still alive and with you, how much more will you rebel after I die? Assemble before me all the elders of your tribes and all your officials, 
So I can speak these words in their hearing and call the heavens and the earth to testify against them. For I know that after my death you are sure to become utterly corrupt and to turn from the way I've commanded you. In days to come, disaster will fall on you because you do evil in the sight of the Lord and arouse his anger by what your hands have made. Sometimes we say the Bible is very honest. And Moses was pretty honest as he talked to God's people. Right? We'll get to that in a second. Well, God wrote the Ten Commandments on stone tablets. Who wrote down the book of the law? Moses. Moses didn't. Hear it. It seems like this is more than just the Ten Commandments. This is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Okay, he's writing down the, the book of the law. And according to Moses, why was it important for the book of the law to be preserved? As a witness, because what are you going to do? You're going to rebel against God. And Moses, after being with those Israelites 40 years in the wilderness, he understood the sinfulness of human beings. And he knew, you know what? Even as I was leading you, you rebelled against God. And when I'm gone, you're going to do it again. And so I've written down God's word. And this is, this is a testimony against you. You have heard what God says. And so when you rebel, when you turn against it, you can't make excuses. And this word is going to stand against you. And Moses tells them what to do with it. This is something I don't know that I had ever picked up it before. Where is this book of the law supposed to be? Not in the Ark of the Covenant. That's where the stone tablets were. But it's supposed to be kept next to the Ark of the Covenant. And he tells us to the Levites. Remember, the Levites are the ones who, who work at the tabernacle and in the temple. They're the, like, the workers with the priests. And, and so this, this book of God's Word was supposed to be kept next to the Ark of the Covenant. And we don't really hear this too much as we go through the Old Testament, but there's nothing that ever changes this. And so one of our assumptions is, you know, where would they keep the official copies of God's Word? Well, where did Moses tell them to keep it? Next to the Ark. And the Ark was, for a time, in the tabernacle, and later it was in the temple. And a couple times the Ark got stolen, which you wonder, then what happens? But kind of the sense that we get is, when God's Word was written down, it was given to the Levites, and they were to store the official copies there at, at the, the temple, next to the Ark of the Covenant. Sam? So often when there's a natural disaster, people say there can't be a God who wouldn't allow this to happen, or even with a family tragedy, and this section sounds like the perfect answer to that. How so? Uh, in the days to come, disaster will fall upon you because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord. Yeah, so Sam, Sam makes a good point that often when disaster comes today, um, either we don't understand it or a lot of times we get mad at God. <coughs> and the, the Old Testament, the Bible itself, it talks a lot about disaster. And first of all, it tells us it comes from, from God and he's got a plan for it. And sometimes it's, it's because we're turned away from God. God corrects even if you don't believe it. God, God corrects us even when we don't believe it. <laughs> so that's what Jesus said. Whenever you see a disaster, what's everybody to do? Repent. repent. When you see a disaster, repent. That doesn't mean that that specific disaster is caused by your specific sin. Not, not always. But every time there's a disaster, it's a reminder. We, we deserve punishment from God. We need to repent and put our trust in Jesus. Do the people suffer when its nation does wrong? Do the people of a nation suffer when it's when it's when the nation does wrong? Um, I would say usually. Sometimes God in His grace gives good things even to people who don't deserve it, right? Mm. But often when when a group of people and their leaders go against God, it's not good things that happen, and the Bible tells us that. Alright, so you think, how does this actually work? God wrote down the Ten Commandments, they're put in the Ark of the Covenant, Moses writes down the Book of the Law, and it's kept next to the Ark of the Covenant, wherever that is. And you can see this this is God's word. This is important. We're gonna 
We're going to preserve God's Word, preserve that original copy as long as we can, presumably next to the Ark of the Covenant. All right, let's keep going. Then you got to turn back to Deuteronomy 11, starting with verse 18. So we've heard a little bit about how this book of the law was written. What we want to end with, of course, is the reminder that God's Word isn't just a book that's meant to sit on a shelf. And sometimes that's how we treat God's Word. You know, sometimes, this isn't one of you, but I've had people come to me very proud. Pastor, I even have a Bible at my house. <laughs> you know, so that sounds good. Where, where is it? Well, it's one of these big ones, and I just keep it sitting on this table in the middle of the living room. Seems like a good spot for it. And well, do you ever, do you ever open it? Do you ever eat? Oh, no, I would never do that. I mean, it's just, like, they almost don't, I don't want to touch it. Like, but it's, I've got it. And, of course, what we're going to end with today is this reminder. God had his word written down for a purpose. And there's very clear things he wants us to do with it. Okay, God's word isn't meant to just be in a book that collects dust on your coffee table. It's living and active. And so we're going to finish with three sections telling us what, what to do now that God's Word is written down. So Deuteronomy 11, starting with verse 18. In my Bible, we're right in the middle of a paragraph. So find verse 18. It says, Fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Teach them to your children. Talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates, so that your days and the days of your children may be many in the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors, as many as the days that the heavens are above the earth. And so far from just storing God's word at the tabernacle, oh, we got God's word. It's right there next to the Ark of the Covenant. What were the people supposed to do with God's word? Actually use it. Actually use it. I've noticed, and maybe I counted wrong, but I, I counted six different verbs that are used for God's Word. Can you find those? Do you know what a verb is? Like an action verb? Six different action verbs? So do these six things with God's Word? Can you just say them when you find one? Fix. Tie. Bind. Teach. Talk. Right? Walk. Walk. Maybe there's more than six. Alright, and so God has all of these all of these uses of God words, not just this book sitting on the shelf. Right? I want you to tie it and bind it and teach it and write it and talk about it and use it and right and just for us to think today, some of the examples given here are maybe something that fits better in their culture. Maybe not. But what would be ways that we could say for us today, this is what God wants me to do with God's Word. Study it. Maybe I could even take it a step further. Memorize it. Oh, I, I said it. I did say it. <laughs> Right? But look at how it starts. Fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. How do you do that? Memorize it. Right? Memorize some passages from God's Word. There's one that really that really impacts you. Memorize God's Word. Good. What else? Share it. Share it. Talk about it with people. Okay? Don't be afraid to talk about it with people in conversations when you're talking about something. You know this is something the Bible talks about. This is what the Bible says. Amen? Okay, and I remember that because when my mother had, was past dying, she could always say the German prayer that she was taught as a child. Mm -hmm. She didn't, you couldn't carry on a conversation, but she could always, and I always remember that because mm -hmm. our pastor, Yankee, always said if you can remember it, he said, if you lose your mind, you will not lose God's word. Thanks. So this is one of the reasons to memorize God's word is that it sticks in our hearts and minds. And, right? Even if people don't lose their memory, usually there comes a point when you can't read very well anymore. Yeah. At least it's really hard to. 
and to be able to think through Bible passages in your mind. And maybe someday the time will come when we're in a position where we don't have God's written word. We said that. There's always been people who tried to take God's word away. and Maybe that happens, but if you have God's word in your heart and in your mind, you can't take God's word away from you. Right? You've got it memorized. Other examples of us doing these things? Teaching. Teaching. So this is why we have Bible study and Sunday school. And hopefully parents of children at home, there's so many different Bible story books and devotion books. and right? Even for couples, maybe you don't have children at home, but to be hearing God's word together and reading God's word together. This is a good thing. I know, it's especially it's just walking along the road. Yeah. I mean, let's be honest, we never ever walk along a road ever anymore, right? So, <laughs> we drive though, and you think, right? What an encouragement. We drive a lot, some of us. What could you do while you're driving? So you realize that you can listen to the Bible for free, right? If you get the Bible app, it's free. And anywhere you're going to cell service, you can listen to the Bible. And they'll read it to you. You can even choose, like, what accent you want people to read it to you in. They'll read it to you in a British accent if you want to. And you can listen to it. And beyond that, there's, there's Christian music. You can listen to Christian music or Christian songs. And you just think, right, it's not everybody's life is going to look the same. But there's so many ways I can put God's Word into practice in, in my life. Right? Let's go on. There's two more I want to read. I know we're getting short on time. Oh, we got just the right amount of time. Back to Deuteronomy 31. I know we're painting around, but it's in the same book. Deuteronomy 31, starting with verse 9. And so we're thinking about God wants His Word used. And this is the Word of God. The official copy was stored in a certain place, but it doesn't mean it was just supposed to sit there. Here's another thing God says, this is what you should do with my Word. So Deuteronomy chapter 31, starting with verse 9. Right? It says... So Moses wrote down this law and gave it to the Levitical priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and to all the elders of Israel. Then Moses commanded them, at the end of every seven years, in the year for canceling debts, during the festival of tabernacles, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God at the place he will choose, you shall read this law before them in their hearing. Assemble the people, men, women, and children, and the foreigners residing in your towns, so they can listen and learn, and learn to fear the Lord your God and follow carefully all the words of this law. Their children who do not know this law must hear it and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. Okay, now some of this should sound familiar. He gets the, the, the book of the law written, and who does he give it to? The Levites, the priests, right? You're gonna, you're, you're in charge of this, right? But now he, he tells them another thing to do with it. What was supposed to happen every seven years? Every seven years, all the people are to gather together, and you're to read through the whole thing out loud, so everybody hears it. You think this is kind of cool, like? Do you know what amount of time that would require? How long would that take to read through the whole thing? It, it depends, I suppose, a little bit on when it says the book of the law. And so are we thinking Genesis, Levit Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, those five books? Or are we thinking just the parts of those books that were the actual law? So like starting with the Ten Commandments, going through Levit. What I mean is like the whole story of Genesis, would that be read too? We're not completely sure. But you can look in your own Bible at if you were to read the first five books out loud, it would take a considerable amount of time. Right? We don't hear about this happening very often, which was part of the problem of God's people. They didn't do what God wanted them to do. We hear about it, 
in the book of Ezra that Ezra actually, this is like a thousand years after Moses, Ezra actually reads the book of the law and it takes hours. And if I remember right, I think they come back the next day and they hear more. Right? And this is just, it's a striking thing. This is important. Okay? You're going to be using this at home. The priests are going to be using this at the temple. But there's got, sometimes you should all gather together and just listen to the word of God being read. And who is supposed to be involved? How many? Anybody. Men, women. Do you notice it says that? Men. It doesn't just the men. Just the men, women, and children. and children. It almost pulls out the children, especially the children. Yeah. All right, can you imagine these? Is, oh, wow, man, it's just a year we got to listen to the whole book of the law. And hopefully that wasn't their answer. It's like, yes, you need to listen to the whole book of the law because this was written down for you. Yeah. It's very important because they segregate in the past and children were not considered individuals until they reached a certain age. But God includes them. Excellent. And even today, sometimes Christians segregate children out separately. Or have, well, during Still worship, today. children go over there, and adults, and we don't do that so much at our church. During worship, if, if the children are able to be in church, we want them there because they're hearing God's word. And they're not maybe comprehending every word that's said, but they're hearing God's word, and God's word is powerful, and Every seven years, read the whole book of the law and make sure everybody's there to hear it. Because you need this. Good. Good. Why, why is it seven? Why is it seven? Yeah, well, it's God's number. It's one of these special numbers in the Bible. And so you think God created the world in six days and the seventh day he rested. You know, our seven-day week comes from the Bible. I was just reading something that, you know, people, sometimes they don't appreciate Christianity anymore, but without Christianity... How long would the week be? <laughs> you ever think about that? Right? If you put it up to the government, it'd probably be like a 10-day week, right? Work eight days and then get two days off. And you know, even a seven-day week, this comes straight out of the Bible. And so seven is sometimes this number of completeness, this number of God. And so every seven years there were special things that were to happen. And then every seventh, seventh year. You follow that? Every seven years you do something special. And then, after the 49th year, then you have a whole year that's special. Jubilee. The year of Jubilee. And so these, this is just a special number, and God wanted his people to do special things. Of, of note, that no nation has filled that to date. So the year Individuals of have, uh -huh. but no nation. The year of Jubilee was something the Israelites never really carried out because it involved a lot of trust in God. And that's what's really hard. All right, I want to get to the last section, but one more thought on this. One, maybe one place I think about us doing this is during Lent. And I don't think this is just a Lutheran practice, but there's been a practice among Christian churches. During Lent, we should read through the whole story of Jesus' suffering and death. And we do that in our Wednesday Lenten services. So those six Wednesdays before Easter, we... Each Wednesday, we read through a kind of a large chunk of this is what Jesus suffered for us. Okay, and I know there's people, even pastors, ah, oh, we shouldn't do that today. Nobody pays attention. They can't sit there and listen that long to that. I think, yes, they can. Yes, you can pay attention. Amen. Yes, you can listen to this. Amen. But, but this would be God. God wants, sometimes it's good to listen to a large chunk of God's word. Okay. And the last Sunday, the sermon text was really long. Did you notice that? It was 29 verses. I didn't notice it at all. It was pretty long today, too. Woohoo! If it was long for you, I had to read it, right? I was up there. But God be praised. It's good to listen to, to God's Word. All right, one more section. Deuteronomy 17. And in Deuteronomy, Moses writes down something for the kings, which is ironic because they didn't have a king. They wouldn't have a king for like 500 years, but God knows what's going to happen in the future. And so God had Moses write down some words for the future kings of Israel. And notice what he says to these future kings. Deuteronomy 17, 
Starting with verse 14. When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you and have taken possession of it and settled in it, and you say, let us set a king over us like the other nations around us, be sure to appoint over you a king the Lord your God chooses. He must be from among your fellow Israelites. Do not place a foreigner over you, one who is not an Israelite. The king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself, or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you must not go back that way again. He must not take many wives, or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. You think these are really wise words for a leader of any country. Also words that almost no leader of any country ever follows. I was about right? to say, how many of those right. did they break? This almost none, immediately. Almost immediately all kings broke this. But what's interesting, look at the next paragraph. So in addition to these wise, wise advice for kings, look at verse 18. When he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law taken from that of the Levitical priests. It is to be with him, and he is to read it all the days of his life, so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees, and not consider himself better than his fellow Israelites and turn from the law to the right or to the left, then he and his descendants will reign a long time over his kingdom in Israel. You think, I have to say, this is a part I did not remember in God's word, but I think this is so special. So what was each king of Israel supposed to do? Make a copy of the Bible for yourself. Not every person could do that, but the king, you can. You have to make a copy of God's word for yourself. And then what was he to do with it? Read it every day. If you are to be a good king, you are to make yourself your own personal Bible, copied from that, that main copy the priest have, and you're to read it every day. And if the king did those things, both he and his descendants would be would be blessed. And this thing, what a what a special encouragement the Bible gave to those kings. All right? Who was in charge of the original copy of the book of the law? Covetous. The priests, the Levites. All right? How many original manuscripts of the Bible do we have today? None. But what do we have today? Copies. And already in the days of Moses, the Bible was being copied. And when that king had a copy, was that still the word of God? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, and so you see with these kings, God's word is being copied down. It's to be read again. We wonder how often did they actually do this. I could see King David doing this. When you hear about King David, I could see King David every day reading his copy of God's word. Some like he did something like that. Not many did. Okay, but God's word is being copied for people today. All right, we gotta, we got to end. Last question. In what ways are we more blessed than the greatest kings in the Old Testament? You have the whole Bible, and you don't even have to copy it by hand. Right? You have the whole Bible, and you have it with you wherever you go, and just reckon that you have something that the greatest kings of the world didn't get to have. Right? You have God's Word. What a blessing, and what should we do with it? We should use it. All right, if there's questions left over, come back next week and we'll keep talking next week and continue on. Next week we're going to trace what happens to this book of the law after Moses dies. And where do we hear about God's word being written more in the Old Testament? So come back again. Let's go to the prayer. Dear Jesus, I'm thankful that you, you brought so many of us together this morning. You can tell us to read and study and use your word. And I'm thankful that you moved our hearts to do so today. We especially thank you for using people like Moses to write your words down to us. We thank you for those who have faithfully copied it and translated it for us today. Ultimately, we thank you for giving us blessings that even kings of the past didn't have. We get to have your word. Lord, forgive us when we let it sit on a shelf or on a table and collect dust. That's not the point. Please motivate our hearts and minds to open up your word, to read it, to hear it, to use it, to share it, to memorize it. May our lives depend on, on what you speak to us. May you be the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.